So this interview with you guys, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, is perfectly timed because obviously the iconic Janet Jackson album came out exactly 35 years ago and almost exactly 35 years ago. It has gone back to number one 35 years after its release. It's topping the charts again. It's that relevant and that fresh sounding still. So the first obvious question is like, how does it feel? It must feel really great to see this record that was so important in uh, 1986 back on top of the charts in 2021. It's kind of surreal to me because um, <clears throat> it was surreal. Listen, when the record even went on the charts and did what it did the first time around was kind of like a dream, you know, or was actually a dream we never even had. I, I don't think we ever thought that it would have, you know, the impact that it did, although we intended to happen like that but you never know how things are going to happen mm -hmm. then i just i always say that i don't i think good music doesn't have an expiration date i mean i think it feels as good or stays as relevant if it's done correctly so i guess this is maybe the proof in the pudding of that it's more than just a cliche it actually uh can happen so i'm glad people are finding it in their own way and I just love the bridge that music connects with people because now there's a whole younger generation that's discovering it and finding it. And their, you know, older brothers and sisters and moms are going, I told you, see, that was my record when I was growing up type of thing. I just love when that happens. Did you, I assume you saw her tearful, grateful reaction after it went back to number one. Um, what were your emotions when you saw that and saw how much it meant to her? I loved it because she just, she's always been so, it's always been about the fans to her. She really has always engaged with her fans. And it's the thing that have always made her album. So I think relevant to people is that whatever she was going through in her life, I remember when she, she didn't do a lot of interviews. I mean, never really has, but I always said anything you wanted to know about her, all you needed to do was just listen to the albums because everything that she's feeling are all in the lyrics of the songs. But I think it takes on a greater depth to her now being a mother. Mm. I think that's a whole different realm of emotions than she's ever felt before. Um, and I think that's kind of what I saw when I, when I watched that video, because we had talked to each other um, maybe a little bit or texted each other back and forth just a little bit before that. And I just sense that everything has a deeper meaning to her now because there's, a, there's just more importance to, to everything now, I think, because of, of, of having a son. Terry, do you have any, what was your thoughts when, um, you know, you, you've had this full circle moment of this work you guys did together, this important work, being back on the charts, seeing Janet being so moved by that, what was going through your mind? Well, I can tell you that the first thing that comes to mind is the work that I know that, that Janet puts in. Um, and once again, one's idea of being relevant in whatever circumstance um, and in whatever era, like the work that we put in back then to actually be taken as a great body of work today is outstanding. And, I, and she deserves all of that and more just because of her, of her willingness to try things. Like mm -hmm. a lot of people were afraid to, I guess, not fit in. I guess outfit, as you would say, and, and actually try things. Um, and Jam was always the one to do that. And by doing that, I think she revolutionized, I guess, female artistry in a, in a way. I, I, I like to say, but I just I just love to see her happy. That's that's more than anything. I don't really care what anyone else thinks. It's like you put in the work, you do what you're supposed to do. She's always there and about the music and about the fans and entertaining and being uh, the example that she needs to be. And I just like to see her get the accolade. So I am extremely happy. And I, I, I'm, I'm glad that people can look back and have that memory to bring them forward. So it's a, you know, got to look back to look ahead. So we're on great footing right now. Well, there's definitely been, um in some people's eyes, at least a, a Janet Renaissance in recent years, you know, I think it kind of started with, you know, she got the Billboard Lifetime Achievement Award, the Billboard Music Awards. A couple of years ago, she had she finally got into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I was there. I went. That's the only ceremony I've ever attended. It was really a special moment with Janelle Monet. You know, again, as you said, like um, 
you know, inspiring women, Janelle Monet saying how important uh, Janet had been to her. And then there was the State of the World Tour, which was really, really well received and unbreakable. And so there's been sort of in the last five years or so, there's been, I think, a surge of it, which I think is, it makes me happy. So I'd love for you to speak about why you think in the last five years, finally, you know, there not that people stopped ever appreciating her, but there's been this new surge of it, which is sort of climax with her control being back at number one. What are your thoughts on on this new round of appreciation for her? I did think people are just reminded, um, you know, after you get a whiff of that smell that you really love, <laughs> you just crave that. And, you know, to be reminded of something that was so impactful in your life. And then, and then share that with people currently and then for them to receive it the same way. It, it just makes it, uh, I don't know, it's just a star. You just put a star next to whatever that is. You know, um, that impact, man, this is, is what we've done over the years um, as our, our listenership. Like we listen back to Gamble and Huff records and they just inspire us to move forward. Like, so for people to hear the Janet records and say, wow, I just want to be a part of that. I just want to have a part of that. That's outstanding, man. That's, uh, you know, I'm really speechless and I don't really have that much to say ever, hardly anyway. <laughs> but um, because it, it's all about the work and to know that the works is speaking for us. I mean, what? Can't do no more. I have nothing else to say. It's, it, it's, uh, it's just a special time. And, and, like I said, I just love for her to get that recognition. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that definitely makes me, I have to address this. So the anniversary of this album and it going to number one kind of coincided within a day or two of Justin Timberlake. Finally, finally took him 17 years. I'm sorry. I'm just going to say it took him 17 years, but he did apologize um, for his role in what happened at the 2004 Super Bowl and, and how he did not handle that necessarily the best way he could have. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Cause you say you're happy to see Janet happy, happy. And we all know she got a real raw deal from that situation. Her career was, um, you know, it derailed her career at the time. She's obviously rebounded from it and that's happy to see. Um, but yeah, what are your thoughts on, uh, just that apology and just how now that we have some distance from that situation, it seems like we've been able to move on from that. Well, I, I think most people have moved on. I mean, all I can say is, uh, Justin, what took you so long? <laughs> you know, to let her take all of the heat from that and, and you know, to kind of remove yourself from the, the, uh, the circumstance. I mean, when you were the, actually the one that pulled everything <laughs> and and actually were part of making it happen. I mean, it's it's kind of odd to me. But, you know, as I reflect on it, I mean, at the time I probably was really pissed off because he didn't say something. But now we I've definitely moved on. You know, because I, you know, how hypocritical are we to sit around and talk about what she did wrong and there's many sites that we could put on things that are far worse than what happened. Now, everybody's seen a breast before, like no matter whose fault it was or wasn't, it wasn't there. Unless you blew it up and magnified it, like it wasn't a problem. So, you know, it, reflecting back, I just wish he would have stepped forward earlier and kind of laid himself in the line of fire too and, and took his shots. But now who cares? The thing that was interesting to me, or my observation of it was, was the way that it got reported. So Janet's record went back to number one because Janet Jackson Appreciation Day coincided with the Super Bowl day, mm -hmm. as it has, thanks to Matthew Cherry and a few other people, a few other fans that would really got involved with that. So um, I think that the story was very much, that was a very positive story. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when Justin Timberlake a few days later or whatever it is, does the apology, all of a sudden the story becomes somehow that the record goes back to number one because of Justin Timberlake. And I don't know whether that's just, I mean, to me, it showed where the societal thing that happens that females have been saying for years, how things get hijacked from them. And somehow now all of a sudden the story becomes the male 
and it's such a dominated, uh, you know, maybe the media industry is dominated by males. I don't know what it is, but that was the thing that I noticed that really rubbed me the wrong way because that was not the story. Huh. The story was the album went back to number one. That's its own story with the fans, with the people that appreciate the music and all of that. And now the fact that he apologized, that came after the fact of the record going back to number one. But somehow it got reported like, as a result of him apologizing, the record went back to number one. And so the narrative is so screwed up as it has been for years. And I think, but I, but you know, listen, the fans called it out. There were people on social media. It was interesting because even TMZ, I remember not the TMZ is, you know, the arbiter of, of everything. But I remember when people were, where they were saying, according to TMZ, and they were using that to report the story. And these are some media people who I know know better then that that's not the story, but it was too easy to just do it. And sometimes it's just kind of clickbait. It's like, let's put those two names together. And, um, you know, now we have a story. Um, so that was the thing that was disappointing about it to me. Um, the fact that Janet had no reaction to it other than what we talked about earlier, which was her heartfelt reaction to the fans, was very much to me the right reaction to have. It's about her and her fans. It's not about Justin. It's not about what happened back in the day. It's about what's happening right now and where she's at. Absolutely. I personally think that when Justin was invited back to play the Super Bowl halftime three years ago, I think it was that Janet should have been part of that or there instead. I don't know well, if you no. were. There was a oh. justice for justice for Jan uh, justice for Janet yes. hashtag going on at that time. I, well, what, the reason I remember it is because Terry and I were asked to curate 11 nights of music for the Super Bowl, free concerts, which were actually outdoors in the middle of winter. <laughs> we called it cold cella, like Coachella, but cold cella. <laughs> we were literally outdoors. We had 5,000 people every night. And when the NFL asked us to do it, we were very much not that enthusiastic about doing it because obviously this was back in the Colin Kaepernick uh, things that was happening and there was a whole lot of things. What we ultimately decided was that it was about really showcasing the best of, of Minnesota music mm. and it was everybody from obviously we, we the revolution came back together and played the time reunited and played. I mean it was a whole Sheila E. It was a whole bunch of great people but it was also you know, soul asylum. And it was, um, you know, it, it, it was really kind of the, the whole kind of legacy of, of Minnesota music. And we thought that that was the better, the better message that got out there. And so um, we were certainly aware of the whole Justin Timberlake thing. And there was this whole thing that how could the Super Bowl in, be in Minneapolis? And not only are you not showcasing Minneapolis music, but the person that you're having perform has basically the those the records were made the Janet records were made in Minnesota they were made in Minneapolis so how now when that's in your hometown is that person not being celebrated as part of what we're doing so it was yeah it was it was a weird time for sure I absolutely remember that. well the the last thing I want to ask about that and then I want to go down a little memory lane more about the making of control is I know you guys worked on Demita Joe in 2004 right the record that came out about six weeks after the Super Bowl and I'm putting quote marks in the air scandal because I didn't think it was scandalous but the scandal so that record ended up being as we as we know a little bit dead on arrival because it wasn't getting it, the radio play and the MTV play and stuff because of the fallout of that so what was your reaction at that time? Because that was a quality record, record like all giant records are. It was a record that you were involved with and, and you know, your work wasn't getting the attention that it normally would have or should have because of this BS that happened at the Super Bowl. The thing that was interesting to me was once again, the kind of the narrative of media at that point in time, because YouTube and, and TiVo and all of these things were kind of still new technology. So the, I think that there was this thing where people thought, wow, what a great publicity stunt to put, you know, as the record's coming out, because there was this kind of idea of just grabbing for attention, mm -hmm. right? And the thing I said was, I remember somebody the very next day, I think I did an interview with somebody and they said, wow, it's a great way to get attention. And I said, yeah, but we, the record's not done. <laughs> it, it would be different if that happened 
and that night we released the single or we released the album, yeah, okay, then maybe it's a publicity stunt. The fact that the album is still six, eight weeks from being even completed was like, wait, you guys have the wrong narrative here once again. You know, the other piece of it too, I was involved very much, very heavily with the Grammys, as I still am. Mm -hmm. And that was the thing where the Grammys, uh, to their credit, they were fine with Janet coming on. They had planned on having her on. She was, she was, they were fine with it. Um, but unfortunately, as we found out, Les Moonves, CBS, they were not fine with it. But it wasn't ever the Grammys. And the Grammys got a lot of blame mm -hmm. at that point in time. And yeah. I, and I, but I always said, and I say to this day, the Grammys were fine with it. The Grammys aren't in the business of trying to censor people and trying to um, do that. They're let, let artists be artists. But because it was on the same network, it was CBS Super Bowl and CBS Grammys, um, it just created a weird um, kind of situation. So yes, the album didn't get, but you know, that's one of those things. And now people are going back and listening to the record mm -hmm. and they go, wait, this was actually a really good record, you know? And that's, you know, listen, the proof's in the pudding. If you do the work and you do it right, Terry keeps mentioning the, the word work and that's mm -hmm. what it is. You put the work into it. We put it in the same as we would always do. And um, we're proud of the records that we've done with Janet. So we, uh, were, we were fine with that. As well you should. And it must feel really good for all of the records that you did with Janet, whether it's Demita Joe, whether it's Control, to be getting this new renaissance, especially in, in light of all this kind of these dark times that followed in the in the aughts, right? Like, do you, is it vindicating at all to see this this new wave of appreciation for someone who deserves it so much? It's the ultimate review, right? I guess we all live in the Hippocratic world here. It's like there's hypocrisy everywhere. People that tell you you're lying are usually lying. People are telling you you're cheating are usually cheating. People telling you that you have a scandal are usually scandalous. But the music lives on and it doesn't lie. Yeah, something, by the way, I was gonna, I was just gonna say, because something when you it reminded me when you mentioned you mentioned Unbreakable, which was five years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, it was interesting when we did our very first interview, um, kind of as the local guys do good interview with the Minneapolis Star Tribune paper. Mm -hmm. And John Bream was the columnist. He still is the columnist there. And I remember he said to us, this was around control. And he said, you guys are the hottest producers was the way the, the, he, he started. And we said, yeah, we don't really want to be hot. We just want to be warm for a long time. <laughs> So, well so, th so th five years ago, when Unbreakable came out, went to number one on the chart, opened at number one. And he called and he said, hey, I want to interview you guys. And the first thing he said, how's it feel to four decades, uh, you know, later, you guys had, you know, 80s, 90s, 2000s, and now the 2010s, you've had number one records. How does that feel? And I said, you remember what we told you back when you first interviewed us? He said, what's that? I said, we want to be warm for a long time. And he just kind of laughed. And I said, yeah, that's what it is. So I say that to say that that's really the story here, if there is a story. It's about consistency, it's about longevity, and it's what I call the equity of credibility. It's something that you have to build up over time where people gain trust, whether it's the artist, whether it's the fans or whatever, that they trust that your intent is to do the right thing. Even if they don't like the record, it's like they can still like us and go, that record sucks, Jim and Lewis record suck. But at least we think they like us because we've built up an equity of credibility with them over the years. And it takes time to do that. So we're glad that we're still around to experience that. Well, do you, are you and um, Janet, I don't know when the last time you recently um, spoke with her was, if you sort of had a celebration if you, about all the uh, these things that have been happening about the number one uh, revival of control, et cetera. But yeah, it's been more than five years since Unbreakable. And if I'm not mistaken, that was the first time you'd worked together in about nine years or so when you, reun you know, reunited for Unbreakable. With all of this going on, it's time for another Jackson, Jam and Lewis collaboration. Are you going, I don't, she's, I know she's focused on motherhood as you say, but like, is there a new Jackson, Jan Jackson record in the works possibly? It's always, when we put a wish list together, she's always the top of the wish list. So everybody can just hope that the wishes come true, that the stars align and, and, and we can make something happen. But no, we talk all the time. And normally 
when we, we we either talk or we you know text back and forth and stuff and but what we always text back and forth is either funny stuff like people falling down and <laughs> or you know it's always weird stuff like that or it'll be you know isa um playing the drums or playing the violin or playing the bagpipes or you know it'll be all of that kind of stuff and that's that's what we really enjoy that always makes our day so um we talk a little bit about music but we more just talk about just kind of the human relationship that we that we have now okay well of course all of um all of the fans would would love to see that so we were sort of talking about kind of in the me too era that we have sort of the reckoning that's happened since the 2004 super bowl with people who were kind of judgy and slut shamey back then you know having this change you know change of heart thank god but there was another interesting kind of feminist slant to control specifically that a little over four years ago in the presidential debates, um, Janet got another spike for nasty when uh, Donald Trump made that comment about nasty woman uh, called Hillary nasty. I'm wearing my nasty woman necklace today. I see that. That's interview. awesome. I That's bought awesome. it right after that. So yeah, tell me a bit, little bit about, and not necessarily just that, but in general, how these songs sort of have taken on new life as kind of feminist or you know pro woman anthems you know, 35 or so years later, I, I imagine you were uh, amused or it certainly caught your attention when Nasty suddenly like spiked on Spotify because of a political thing. It's always interesting too, when, you, when you're doing it in the moment and you're coming up with maybe lines that you think are kind of clever and like even things like, give me a beat that I hear like in all the basketball games and then a, a song will come on. Not necessarily our song, but another song will come on or whatever. Or you'll hear, you know, people that miss Jackson if you're nasty, or you'll hear just kind of catchphrases that, you know, what have you done for me lately? I heard um, Don Lemon say on CNN <laughs> uh, during the uh, election, because they had been, you know, you know, they, well, I can't remember what the example was, but that, that was his, like, his thing. So it, those kinds of catchphrases and the fact that it comes out of that are, are really cool, um, because they become part of uh, culture, even beyond the music. But it just, you know, it's the thing that music does. It just kind of gets into your soul without you even knowing it. And, you know, not to go off on a whole tangent, but it's interesting that we've talked about it many times where in schools, right, the things whenever you're trying to cut costs, they always take the arts programs away in schools. And it's the weirdest thing to me, because if you think about how you learn the English language, the first thing you learn is the, al the alphabet. And if somebody lined up 26 things in a row, letters right and they said learn these in order and you went a b <laughs> it's like there's no way you do it as <laughs> soon as you put a melody to it a b c d e f g it's easy right think about sesame street think about electric company think about all these shows that taught kids back in the day we're going to take the most effective way that you can possibly learn which is rhythm and melody we're going to take that out of school and expect kids to do better so I just think music is so important and we have a chance and a responsibility to make it important to people. And that's the thing that, you know, I think is so important about these records. And that's why 35 years later, you may not remember what you were doing 35 years ago, but if you put on Nasty or you put on What Have You Done For Me Lately or you put on Control, all and those memories all come back to you. And there's something that's very divine about that that I think is, is really cool and people should recognize. It just dawned on me at the other song that was spiking at the time of that nasty woman comment was nasty by vanity six which is another yeah, minneapolis connection yeah <laughs> just exactly. totally dawned on me those are like the two theme yep. songs so there's something in that that minneapolis uh water so going back to actually the making of control going back 35 years um this was her third studio album but i don't think at the time i was aware of it i think a lot of people think of it unofficially at least as her first studio album because it was you know it was her coming out record you know establishing her identity or rival was her first really big hit record and so tell me how i mean i she was only 20 at the time she was she was quite young right she was 20 i think 19. wow okay yeah. so she was quite young what was her mindset like how did you guys get together and did she have a sort of like you know agenda if that's the right word of like this is going to be my statement record, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the title track alone state nasty woman as well. What all of these, these were very empowerment anthems. What have you done for me lately? What was that conversation like? 
it was a conversation that actually took place over a period of time. When she first came to Minneapolis, um, she, she, we just talked, we hung out, we rode around and we went to the, you know, hung up the lakes. We went to the movies cause it was summertime. So it was actually nice weather. And then we'd go hang out at clubs at night and just that kind of thing. And after about four or five days of that, I remember her saying, um, when are we going to get started working? And Terry and I said, oh, we've been working. And we showed her the lyrics or at least the skeletal lyrics to control talking about her leaving home, moving out on her own, that, you know, asking her parents permission. And when she looked at the lyrics, she just said, wait, this is what we've been talking about. And we said, yeah. And she said, okay, wait, so whatever we talk about, that's what we're gonna write about? And we said, yeah. And then she said, oh, well, then I wanna talk about this and I wanna talk about this. But it, it, the light bulb came on in her head because it was the first time that someone had said to her, what are your ideas? Um, what do you wanna talk about? before the first two albums, she just went in and sang the songs. And she, at that point in time, it was more, I think her dad's idea. It wasn't like she had a burning desire to be a singer or to be an artist at that point. Huh. She liked acting. Um, she was on fame. She was doing television shows. She was doing those kinds of things. When we got her, she was focused. And at that point, I think she had decided she wanted to really be an artist. And so all we did was just kind of, I guess, light the fuse and then she, all the ideas just flowed from there. And I think that's when it came to her mind that, wow, I can I can really say something here that, that means something. Gary, what are your memories of those kind of, what what comes, what first pops into your mind when you think about this process? Uh, give it to me free. <laughs> I think for the first time, I think when she came up to Minneapolis, she was exposed to just a free life. Like, because as a Jackson, I can only imagine the amount of scrutiny and sequestering that you would have, you you would, you would move from place to place, always with some kind of bodyguard or or with some kind of supervision. When she came to Minneapolis, she came to Minneapolis alone with a girlfriend, and so we were just hanging. Like it, there was there was no agenda at all, other than hey, let's get to know each other and figure out what we want to do creatively. And so once she figured out that she could just be whatever she wanted to be, it was a breeze from there on. I mean, then she just jumped right in both feet and like I said, tried things that ordinarily she wouldn't have tried because someone would just tell her what to do. So we would just try things and she would just be amenable just to try anything. She'd come up with ideas. We try things with her along with her. So we would, <clears throat> bounce things off of each other and uh the process was just seamless that way i th i think there was a trust factor too terry because nasty is a good example of what you were talking about when we did the track to nasty i remember that when she went in and started singing it initially she was singing in like her normal janet jackson voice and she was like sitting in the movie show and we were like no sing it like an octave low, because she would always play around and go like that eh, and sing like that. We said, I sing it low like you like you mess around. She said, really? And we said, yeah, 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 just try it. And then she was like, sit in, in the movie show, like singing low. And she, I don't think she thought it was going to sound good. And the next day when she came back after we had comped the vocal together, she heard it and she was like, wow, you know? And so that attitude was the thing that we tried to bring out because she had it as a little girl. She was such a, feisty is the word I always use. She was on the shows and she was always had all this attitude all the time. But then the records she made at, up to that point were all these very kind of soft, pretty records. Mm. And we were like, let's get that attitude back and let's give her tracks that are aggressive. And then when you give her to that kind of track and then you have her sing like in a low voice, like on Nasty, all of a sudden to me, that was kind of where the magic was. And once she figured that out and we had the trust with each other, we trusted that whatever we threw at her, she could do. And she trusted whatever she threw at us, we could do. And that was, the, to me, the magic that has, you know, continued to this day. Did um, you butt heads at all with her family? Like with Joe or whatever? Was there any kind of issues of like, um, you know, resting control from, you know, an over-controlling family? Because, you know, as, as Terry mentioned it, you know, that was the situation she had grown up in. We only had um, actually one meeting with Joe where he told us, uh, don't make my daughter sound like Prince. 
<laughs> so, you know, don't make my daughter risque. Um, oh, don't make the daughter risque. That's interesting because obviously she got sexier as she got older with her imagery. Yeah, but that's basically don't make my daughter sound like Prince. That's what the, the uh, interpretation probably meant. So at that time, you know, Prince was pretty free and a lot of people deemed him as a uh, risque artist. So not to make my daughter that, but I think, you know, uh, Janet, once again, she's just a revolutionary person. She's always going to go and paint outside the, the lines a little bit, just because that's just the way she is. Um, and in, in a quiet, sweet way though, you know, it's, 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 um, I don't know, it's a, it's a crazy dichotomy. It's like, you would never think a person that so soft-spoken could be that forceful. And that is, is an amazing combination of things because you get your point across in a different way without people feeling like you're shouting at them. They process it a little different. So I think it really worked on her, uh, to her benefit. But the music became her superpower. That's, that's, that's what I think she realized was more than even her saying things that she could say so much more through her music. Um, and even I remember when we did Rhythm Nation and I remember when we, after starting with, you know, Rhythm Nation, State of the World, the knowledge, and then she says, get the point, good, let's dance. So she realized that she has people's attention, but that coming across as a song or as a melody, is, it's more attention getting. And um, by the way, Terry, Terry was funny because the, the funny thing about what Joe said, and that's exactly what he said, was he started off by saying, you guys are from Minneapolis. And we said, yeah. And he said, Prince is from Minneapolis. And we said, yeah. And he goes, don't have my daughter sounding like Prince. <laughs> it was like, oh, because we're from Minneapolis. OK, so we get it. So that, yeah, that was his only um, that was his only thing. The funny and the other, the other thing I remember about that, we played the album for all her brothers. Michael wasn't there, but I remember, you know, Marlon and Jackie and the rest of them were there. And I remember we played the album and there was two things I remember. One was when, when I think of you played, they said, that's going to be number one. And we're going, huh? No, man, nasty. Uh, you know, pleasure principle. Uh, we're thinking of all these other songs. And they were like, no, that when I think of you, that's the one that's going to be the number one. And we were like, really? And of course they were right about that. The other thing was when she played the album for her mom, I remember when Funny How Time Flies came on, she just kind of faded it out and said, oh, that's it, it's, it's over now. <laughs> she never played the end of Funny How Time Flies for her mom. So that was kind of, that was kind of fun. Actually, now that I, since you've brought up the, the, the concerns that uh, Joe Jackson had about Prince, I, it's dawned on me, did, because there's this through line where you guys work with Prince and you worked with Janet Jackson, did Janet and Prince, ever collaborate together or work together you know there's tons of stuff in the prince vaults that we never hear did they ever work together in any way or was that ever proposed or tried to make happen when we did a uh, love will never do um on the rhythm nation album the thought was maybe this would be cool as a duet with uh, prince and yeah. janet and that's the reason that janet sings the first verse low and then the second verse is high because we were thinking that it might be cool to put Prince on the first verse. Um, and it, you know, it didn't, it didn't ever happen, but it was thought about and talked about. It just never came to fruition. Did you have actually approach Prince or Prince's camp and suggest it, send him the track or anything like that? I, no, I know, no, I don't think, we, I know that I remember we never actually sent it. It was more just an idea that we kicked around. Wouldn't this be cool? This might be kind of cool. And then it just, it just never happened. I don't think it, it I don't think we ever, sent it but that was kind of the thought process as we were doing the song we thought it might be kind of cool to do oh uh, well it was a great idea <laughs> well speaking of great ideas we all know that prince has one of did one of the greatest super bowls of all time we talked about the super bowl with jan we talked about the super bowl with justin and it being in minneapolis i remember that being a little weird also because he did this prince tribute and there was some kind of history uh, mild feuding with Prince and in a little bit, and it was a little weird. But since there's this justice for Janice, how do you guys feel about the idea of Janet doing the Super Bowl as the headliner on her own with you guys next next year? Like, 
I kind of would love to see that happen. What would you envision a, a, a Janet Super Bowl redemption show looking like? I mean, people would lose their minds. Well, it would be, um, I don't even know. I mean, I, I don't think we're even thinking along those lines, but I mean, you're putting it out in the universe. So I want it out we'll, there. We'll, we'll see where the universe, where the universe takes it. Um, I know as a fan of hers beyond, uh, you know, obviously working with her and she's like a member of our family. Um, I would love to see that. I, I'll put it like this. You're not going to have a better catalog of, of uh, hits <laughs> to play. Um, so I, I think it would be a lot of fun, but I think, you know, once again, it, it, that would be up to her. That would yeah. be up to, that would be up to Janet, you know, what she wanted to do. Um, and whether she felt like that was a statement that she wanted to make, you know, um, so, you know, we'll, we'll figure it out. We, we still have a little time. <laughs> we still have, you know, 10 months, 11 months before the next uh, Super Bowl. So, we'll well, on, honestly, I mean, just a, 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 you know, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis Super Bowl would be great given, I mean, we don't even have time. We're running out of time. I haven't even begun to even talk about all the other non janitor, even non Prince things that you were involved with all the other things you've produced, but to uh, to end this interview, I know there's been some talk that you guys are working on an album build as yourselves, you know, perhaps with some special guests. Is there anything you can uh, share about what to expect from the Jam and Lewis record? Well, continuing on the Janet theme, which is always a great theme to be on. Um, Janet, the story of our our album and we are our album is due to and I say due to release in June. <laughs> We're claiming June as our month. Um, which I don't think we've done necessarily yet, but but we're going to proclaim it here. Um, but when we started the record, we started it around the time that Control was done. And um, we had started on a Jam and Lewis record at that point in time. And when the record was done, when the Control record was done, John McLean, who was the A&R, head of A&R for a &M Records, he comes to Minneapolis, we play him Control, we play him Nasty, we play him Pleasure Principle, we play him Let's Wait a While, we play him Funny How Time Flies. Like we're playing all these hits, right? Or we think they're hits. And like all A&R people, he goes, I just need one more. We said, what are you talking about? He said, I just need one more record. We said, no, 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 you got your records. So anyway, we hopped in the car. I think we were going to Rudolph's Barbecue or somewhere, grab a bite to eat. Terry puts a cassette in. And the cassette is basically tracks for our album. So he puts the cassette and he starts, you know, listening. He goes, what's this? And he says, oh, this, we go, this is for our album. So about the third song in, he goes, wait, that's the one I need for Janet right there. That's the one. And we said, so what are you talking about, John? He said, that's the one I need for Janet. So we were like, okay, uh, what, do you, what do you think? He said, man, play it for her. And if she likes it, she can have it. And I said, oh, so you just, now you're just giving away our album. Okay, fine. <laughs> so the next day we go to the studio. We just put the song on. And Janet's just sitting on the couch waiting to come in the room and she's we put the song on and she's kind of there bobbing her head and she kind of walks in she kind of leans on the door and she points at us the song goes off she goes who's that for and we said you if you want it and she and that song ended up becoming what have you done for me lately started her career wow. ended ours or at least our album <laughs> it did not end yours but i get and, what you're saying uh, well, as artist it ended our career and so that was it now over those 35 years we had always in the back of our minds thought, well, we should do an album. But Terry and I don't sing, we write and produce. So it's like, let's get people and write and produce for them and that will be our album. So every time we would ask an artist to do something, they'd go, yeah, yeah, I'll do something. And then when the song was done, they'd go, oh no, I gotta keep this for myself. <laughs> so it was kind of a pattern had, had developed. So five years ago, we kind of thought, let's go and do our album. And that's when Janet called and said, hey, I want you to do our, my next album, which is Unbreakable. So that stopped the process again. About three years ago, when we went into the Songwriters Hall of Fame, we went in the same year that Babyface went in. And somebody asked us, what have you not done that you want to still do? And I remember we looked at Babyface and we said, well, we never worked with Babyface. And we never got around to doing our album. And we thought, let's get, let's get on that path. And that's the thing that kind of started us on that path. So that's kind of the journey of our, of our album. And we put a wish list together of people who we have worked with in the past, some people we had never worked with before, who we wanted to work with. And it's still a work in progress, but you know, I think it'll be a record that, that people enjoy. And if you like the Babyface record, what we did with Babyface, that'll give you an idea of what the album is. 
because people have said to me that it's the most baby face sounding record they've heard him do in years. <laughs> and it's like, that's what we that that's what we want to do as producers. We want to make baby face sound the most baby face that he can possibly sound. And somebody said, well, it doesn't sound like Jam and Lewis. And we said, yeah, but Jam and Lewis's sound is really the sound of the artist. We're the assist guys. We're the Magic Johnsons or, you know, whoever you want to say. We're the people to we set you up to score. We're not the scores, but we set you up to score. So and, and Babyface, when he heard his song, he just was like, I love the way this sounds. And this sounds so good. We said, of course, it sounds good. You're Babyface. What do you think it's supposed to sound like? But sometimes you have to re-fall in love. Like we we're talking about with Janet, people rediscover, re-fall in love. They remember the moment when they fell in love. I think that's what's happening with Babyface. People are going, man, I remember when I first fell in love with Babyface. But also even Babyface himself as the artist, mm -hmm. I think it makes him fall back in love with himself. Because when we, we did Jimmy Fallon the other day and a couple other things and came up with a whole nother song, right? It was just like just being in the room together, kind of get your creative juices flowing. So wow. we're excited about the record. And I think ho hopefully people enjoy, you know, what we've what we've been working the 35 year journey on this album. I know I didn't realize it was 35 years in the making. What a full circle moment that that is coinciding with the song that, you know, with the album that what have you done for me lately? you know, the 35th exactly. anniversary of that and the, and the number one for Janet. So I'm definitely looking forward to the album you guys are putting out in June. I'm definitely looking forward to just putting it out there, you know, another album with Janet when the time is right. I wasn't kidding about the Super Bowl thing with you guys either. I'm putting all the things into the universe because it can't hurt, right? There's, but whatever happens, I know it's going to be exciting. So thank you so much for taking the time to talk about the past, present, and future. And uh, we'll have to do this again sometime when the uh, Rhythm Nation anniversary comes up. We'll do it for every Janet record. Well, we have the 20th anniversary this year of All For You, of the All For You album. All right, let's and let's uh, make a date. Anniversary and 50th anniversary of Sounds of Blackness coming together as a group. 30 years for Optimistic, the song that's optimistic. Wow. But 50 years since they came together. So it's a lot of milestones this year and 40 years since the very first The Time album. All right, well, we're gonna have to do okay. several. We've run out of time well, we'll now, but we'll have we'll to get, get together. together again some other time. Congratulations yeah. on everything. And thank you again for this great conversation. Thank Thanks, you, Lindsay. Lindsay.